Peter Kirschlager, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Kirschlager, right, um, from the University of Lucerne, um, who is professor of ethics there, but director of the Institute of Social Ethics. Um, he's also research fellow at the University of the Free State in Bloemfontein in South Africa. He's been a visiting fellow at Yale. Um, he works, he's a member of the board. Of, there's a list of um, organizations or institutions here, uh, University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, um, Leuven, uh, the Rao, oh, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Sweden. Um, so what I'm emphasizing here again, just like I did with our two previous speakers, is the wide expertise in different places of different aspects of what we've been calling here AI. Um, it's interesting for me that we have ethics brought in here as an explicit label. This is ethics. And I love even more the question of human rights explicitly. Our title for the talk today, um, Peter's title is Striving for a Sustainable and Human Rights-Based Future, um, an International Database Systems Agency, DSA. That's perfect. Thank you. So what I'm trying to look at together with you is um, from an ethical point of view, what needs to be done in order to create a sustainable and human rights-based future for humans, but also for the planet, planet in general. And um, I would like to start with a very general comment on um, this, this research, um, this, this presentation um, is based on the, my recent book on digital transformation ethics published in 2021. So if you wanna know more about then I was able to include in this 20 minutes talk, then um, just um, please um, here you find the, the information. I would like to start also with a general remark on digital transformation and so-called AI. I would say that from an ethical point of view, you could say that there is a positive potential of digital transformation and um, so-called AI um, because both can contribute to and you see that on the picture, allowing humans to flourish, to enjoy human rights and um, the respect of their human dignity. And at the same time, all digital transformation and so-called AI can contribute to a sustainable future of the planet. You see that with the small flowers um, flourishing. At the same time, we have to recognize though, and that was definitely the case in the last two or three decades that we, we experience on a daily basis, um, human rights violations in the area of digital transformation and um, so-called AI. So for example, data is stolen from humans and then sold to, um, to others without consent, but in front of all, um, it, it represents a violation of the human right to privacy and the human right to data protection. And when we would like to address this, um, so, for example, we may consider the idea that we could train um, machines in the way that they would be moral or ethical agents. Then we have to take into account the fact that we have to deal also with the complexity of ethics. So not only technology is complex in that area, but also ethics itself. For example, we have to deal with the dual use problematic. So the dual use problem embraces the fact that, and you see that on this illustration, that the same um, surveillance camera system, including a facial recognition software, could be used to save um, a human uh, in a difficult situation. But exactly the same technology, and this, of course, is, is evaluated positive from an ethical point of view, but this exact same technology-based um, innovation could be used by a dictatorship to suppress um, a peaceful demonstration. So to, it can be used to violate human rights. And now from an ethical point of, uh, point of view, if you have to make an assessment of this technology, you see we cannot only make a general assessment, but we have to go into the technology-based concrete application um, in order to make um, an adequate um, ethical assessment of, of technology. 
Beyond that, there is also um, in ethics part of that complexity, um, the so-called rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete. What do I mean um, coining it as rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete? Ethics has to take into account the concrete situation, the concrete encounter with concrete humans. And here you have the illustration serving this understanding. Um, you see a parent with a kid. The kid needs a, um, a medicine which, with, in order to survive. The pharmacy is closed. You cannot enter the pharmacy. Is the parent allowed to steal the medicine in order to save the life of the kid? For humans, this is quite, um, it is challenging, but it's doable in a sense to find in that concrete situation, the concrete encounter with concrete humans, the, um, eth the ethical right thing to find out what is the ethical right thing to do. Um, for machines, hardly um, impossible. Um, because I would argue, for example, that um, the lack of freedom of machines um, is, is an obstacle in that specific regard. Ethics, though, has to take into account this, what I call rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete, so that we have to basically, in order to reach the higher ethical good in this situation, to save the life of the kid, we have to break another ethical rule. While we're doing so, we are not saying that first, this rule is not in place anymore, of course, of course, this rule is still in place, but we would just say in this specific situation, this concrete encounter with concrete human, um, it is legitimate to break the rule to, and that's the second important point, to strive for a higher ethical good. So we're not stealing in order to enrich ourselves. We're not stealing in order to pursue our self-interest, but in order to serve a higher ethical good. And this goes back to at the end of the day, to at least to Aristotle, who was pointing out um, to the fact that if we are um, setting up rules as humans, we have to be aware of the fact that these rules will have gaps. There will be things which we cannot cover by the rules just because our human existence, because human life is so complex. Um, so this um, has also be has also needs to be taken into account when we are talking about ethics um, in the area of digital transformation and so-called AI. That machines will reach limits because of that complexity, consisting, for example, of the um, of the dual use problem, but also of this rule transcending uniqueness of the. There's some. So, in order to, thank you. In order to, in order to address um, this uh, this complexity, one way to address it, and this is beautifully in line with what what Edward beforehand explained, I would invite that we should have technology disciplines and ethics right from the start in an interaction. Um, because then we are really able to enrich each other right from the beginning and therefore hopefully um, achieve um, more meaningful results. And we avoid that we spend a lot of talent, a lot of resources in innovation processes, which then will run into walls of normative problems, be it ethical, be it legal, legal issues. Um, so um, I would call for, uh, you know, interaction between technology and ethics right from the start and not understanding ethics as something which is reacting um, to technological progress. Also part of, of dealing with that complexity is to critically examine the uh, vocabulary we are applying in this, in this uh, field of research. And one uh, probably the most important example is the use of the term um, so-called artificial intelligence. Because if you look very rigorously uh, at what exactly the machines can do, we will um, see um, that uh, machines surpass human intelligence uh, enormously in the area of dealing with big data, in the domain of memory. So for example, if you were asking me what was happening on November 12, 1922, I couldn't immediately respond to that question. 
um, obviously a machine can do that. Um, although dealing with big data, a machine can um, you know analyze big data in a very uh, short amount of time and uh, you know communicate um, helpful, meaningful results. We humans need more time for that, and sometimes we are not even able to do that. Or take logical deduction. Also, there um, machines surpass human intelligence by far. That's the reason why not only I is a hobby um, chess player loses against machines, but also the human world champions in chess lose against against machines. So there are areas where machines surpass already humans, um, but um, that will be even more so in the future, um, just because of the uh, mathematical potential of machines, which can be also scaled up in the future quite a bit. Then there are though other domains of intelligence, of human intelligence, where I would um, say, that machines are not only not able to perform in these areas nowadays, but I would argue, I would go so far to argue that it won't be possible um, in the future at all. So, for example, in the area of emotional and social intelligence, I would argue that um, machines will be able to simulate what humans do. Um, so, for example, if you take a real healthcare robot, I can train that healthcare robot that it needs to cry if the human um, patient cries or needs to show some empathy, but I wouldn't argue that there is um, authentic emotions in play um, by the by the um, healthcare robot, but it's rather to, that he tries to it it tries to simulate what humans usually do in such such situations. So the, the problem which um, machines cannot surpass here is that it remains inauthentic. So it is not real. It's just a simulation of what humans train the machines to perform. And also in the area of moral capability, so the capability of humans to recognize ethical principles and norms is something I would argue is not um, achievable for machines due to the lack of freedom, due to the lack of autonomy. Um, take, for example, a self-driving car. I can teach that car to do not harm to, to humans, um, and the, the self-driving car will um, follow that rule, but it could be exactly the same self-driving vehicle I could teach to run over humans to be faster from A to B, and the self-driving car would, with, the ex with the ex exactly the same um, strive for perfection, um, fulfill that rule, because the ethical quality of that rule is not accessible for the machine. So the conclusion of that is, I would say, well, if we are understanding that only certain domains of human intelligence are achievable for, for so-called um, artificial intelligence, then we should restrain from, from using that term, but rather find a term which is really describing what machines can do um, and mostly do. And that's the reason why I would suggest that we um, use the term database system, because at the end of the day, what is in the focus of it, what is the fundament of the machine performance? It's data, data, data. So I would call, I would invite um, you to use the, the term database systems. And now, um, if I'm saying, well, more capability is something which humans can perform, but machines cannot, I'm not saying that ethics should be irrelevant for that field, for that um, field. of course not. In country, I would um, ask for database systems, DS, with ethics, um, but uh, underlining the fact that humans need to uh, take up the responsibility to program, but in front of all, to train machines with ethics, um, because machines themselves cannot do it um, because of the lack of autonomy. The lack of autonomy can be also illustrated by the imagery that the first line of a code is written by a human. And I would argue that the machine cannot liberate itself from that heteronomy, so being um, influenced by, by humans. So there's an res exclusive responsibility with humans to train database systems with ethics. And if you then ask, okay, but which ethics should it be? Looking at this issue from a global um, perspective, I would argue for human rights um, as the basis for the ethics which we should train 
um, DS database systems in, um, why human rights? Human rights represent a minimum standard. They're not luxury. They're not the higher ethics, but they're just a minimum standard allowing humans to survive uh, on one hand and on the other hand, allowing humans to live a life with human dignity, um, a life as humans. So it's some, it's a, it's a, it's a basis which is not asking too much from technology based progress, but really requiring just a minimum standard, uh, setting clear prior priorities, very much practice oriented and concrete, because what could be more concrete than the survival, um, of humans and the life, um, as, as humans and also representing a global consensus independent from different cultural or religious or worldview based um, communities um, and contexts, because actually human rights are the um, catalog of principles and norms, which are actually not only protecting that cultural, religious and worldview based plurality, but also fostering by this, this plurality and diversity by allowing every human to be free and autonomous in its choice um, of um, realizing it, his or her ideas of his or own, her own lives and, and also being free and autonomous to realize these and implement these, these ideas. Now, if we take human rights-based database systems seriously, then we recognize uh, not looking into the future, but really analyzing um, our present times and the situations in the area of digital transformation and database systems, that there are many human rights violations occurring um, in front of all because um, the, the probably some or even most of the um, most important business models in the area of social media, in the area of digital transformation, and in the area of database systems are in their core business models violating human rights. So not just violating human rights as a collateral um, side effect, but in their core business models. And therefore, I would um, postulate that, that we need to do so much more in um, you know, addressing these human rights violations. It's not enough that we make all these beautiful declarations and guidelines and standards, um, but we really need to um, address these human rights violations um, with <clears throat> a strong policy and regulatory response um, in order to make sure that, that human rights are not only protected and implemented and realized in the so-called offline world, but also in the um, online um, reality and in the digital um, domain. How could this be achieved? My concrete suggestion would be to create an international database systems agency, DSA, at the UN in order to um, make sure that only database systems serving the human dignity of all humans and a sustainable existence of our continuation of existence of our planet um, and others are not um, allowed to, to um, be realized or put on, on the market. I think this idea in analogy to um, nuclear technologies, um, not only because, for example, Elon Musk pointed out um, that um, so-called AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Um, but in front of all, also because if you take the analogy of, of nuclear technologies, you can find out, simply put and summarized, that we first did research in the area of nuclear technologies, then we built the bomb, then we dropped the bomb several times as humanity, and then we realized that we need to do something concretely in order to avoid the worst. And I would say, of course, this, this, this regime, this, this system of the International um, Atomic Energy um, as a Agency is not perfect. It has its geopolitical implications. But what we can say, though, is that it was able to avoid worse um, to happen. And I would argue for an agency who has not only regulatory um, competencies, 
but is also regulating um, the admission to market of, of um, innovations um, and has also some legal competencies to intervene if something goes wrong, uh, competencies to sanction also um, problematic behaviors um, in order to, to make sure that we can avoid um, diverse. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> I I wrote all these little notes to myself with um, exclamation marks at the end of every concept. Um, but let's first open it up to um, the rest of the audience here. Does anyone have a question, a comment about any one of the three speakers, but now for Peter's talk as well? So I'm going to make this a personal conversation again for a moment. I just wanted to, um, you, you used right from the beginning the concept so-called AI. And, and that was my first exclamation mark, so-called. And I can tell you even here, since we're all friends, that when we first started planning this year's meeting, um, I think, Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we even called it at first just as an AI and then we said, no, AI is more um, limited than saying something else. So we chose technology. Um, I think, Peter, you were saying not just justice and technology, but digital technology. I mean, you, you didn't use the word technology, but uh, the, the word digital, but you used database instead. Um, but the, the point is that AI, artificial intelligence, is a certain, at least for those of us who used to work in it, in the 80s, we were all doing AI, and then it sort of died for a while, and then it came back again. And it came back again because of the large da data, because of the big data. That, that was the whole point. And AI is a certain aspect that you want to talk about, as you did. And you said that's it's a matter of intelligence and what is intelligence and can machines ever be as, as intelligent as human beings or not even as intelligent, but just isn't this just a different kind of, of um, wherewithal rather, rather than talk even about intelligence. And I was wondering about the connection you made near the end between all of that and the business model, the, the fact that, that it is business that's running everything, um, that it is, I usually say, capitalism rather than <laughs> rather than business. But either way, what we're looking at is a certain um, structure that limits us in a different way, limits or perhaps even opens things up, but only in what you're calling the business model. And I wonder if we go elsewhere to other ways of governance or other ways of uh, making a living, but not through a capitalist basis, would it? Would things be completely different? Uh, in other words, I'm asking about that connection that you made um, between the business model and the three or four steps that you went through so clearly getting um, to ethics. So I know that wasn't exactly, but it's the business model that I want to ask you about. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna, for for your comments and for your feedback, also, and for your questions. I think if we if we acknowledge that data is at the core of these technology based um, innovations, um, then we should call it that way in order to also um, manage the expectations. Because you could ask, okay, why is it of ethical relevance if you call it uh, AI or if you call it database systems? I would argue, well, first of all, because it's it's kind of um, managing expectations more adequately. And secondly, it has also ethical implications because if you really think that so-called AI would be intelligence, then we would need to discuss the possibility to attribute a certain kind of moral agency to machines, which I would be, um, you know, consequently against it um, because it would um, give power to so-called AI in a way which is not 
um, legitimate, uh, justifiable from an ethical point of view due to the lack of freedom and autonomy and therefore also corresponding responsibility. Now, um, regarding your, your second aspect, why I would, um, you know, coin the problem as such that is in the core business model and not just in capitalism in general, um, I would I would say if you look at, for example, the Facebook case, so looking at what we found out thanks to several whistleblowers, the last prominent ones last fall, basically pointing out to the fact that Facebook was aware of the fact that hate speech and call for violence did lead to um, literally people killing people in real life. And what was striking, I mean, in addition, what was striking was that Facebook was aware of that. It didn't stop these um, incitements on in social media, but rather continued to foster it in order to keep the people in on the platform and but therefore, um, you know, earning more money with it. And so you can understand that this is really part of the core business model. I create hate. I create um, anger in order to keep people on the platform and thereby I, I'm more profitable with this kind of business model. And I would criticize that not only because it's just ethically um, absolutely unacceptable to do business that way, but I would also point out to the fact that the business model is the problem because I would say you could run a social media platform with a different business model, also economically very profitable, but with a clear um, human rights um, based approach. You know, also, for example, using now, um, you know, video conference software also for this conference. Um, this is a video, conf video, uh, video conference software, which is violating all the, the, the human right to privacy and the human right to data protection of all participants. Um, and I could imagine, though, and this is again a problem of business models, because I could imagine someone um, offering a video conference software which would be perfectly in line with the human right to privacy and the human right to data protection. And that would be also the task for the DSA to, to make sure that there are profitable business models in the area of database systems and digital transformation, but they need to respect um, human rights right from the start in their way of, of, doing, of doing business. And if you think, and if you think that's naive, and the net issue is dreaming, um, then look at the pharma industry. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry, I don't want to defend it for all its, its problems it has from an ethic point of view. But what you could tell is that we have a very strictly regulated admission process for, uh, you know, for uh, new um, medical um, solutions. Um, in order to get them to the market, you need to run through a process of admission, which is heavily regulated, and it needs time. Um, in order to save humans for from you know negative effects and also to save environment from negative effects, there nobody would question that we have such a process in place. If you look at database system digital transformation, you could literally put everything on the market, and you don't run into any legal problems. I mean, we're starting to get a little better in that regard in front of all in that on the European continent, but still, it's 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 quite quite impressive how unregulated this, this market is and be realizing what kind of problems we are running into. So we can, um, we can see that we are able to, as, as humanity, to organize also strongly technology-based um, markets um, better than we do right now in the area of, of database systems and digital transformation. Thank you. Yeah, but isn't there the, the Achilles heel that it's not just commercial users, but there are also states using AI systems or database systems. And uh, so, for example, secret services and the militaries. And uh, there it is much harder to see some common constraints that everybody would apply, right? First of all, not everybody would want to go along with such a system. And secondly, there would always be a significant danger and fear of some people cheating. And we then fall behind because we are not allowing ourselves to do what the other side is doing. So that's where I see a big worry. And so if I were to make the, this is not realistic claim against you, I would uh, appeal to states and their likely non-compliance with any reasonable rules. 
Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. I absolutely agree with you that the, the dimension of states is, is um, very essential um, regarding dealing with digital transformation database systems, as you were describing very adequately. Um, I would argue, though, that you could use the same argument um, in favor of global cooperation. So in order to, you know, as a state, take, for example, Switzerland, in order to um, protect myself, in order to make sure that no one else cheats um, on me in that specific area, it would be in, the, in the, my own self-interest to agree with such a global cooperation because the damage could not only infect, you know, the other countries, but could infect also uh, my own country. So similar to the process leading to the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency, because they are also debating in someone, I think some people were saying, some opponents were saying to that idea, well, if we then have this regime in place on a global scale and we are the only ones respecting it, then we run exactly into the problems you were describing. Why should we do that? And there, but at the end of the day, the winning side was the one who basically was able to show, look, if someone is cheating on this regime, that will have a global impact, a global, I mean, it will destroy the planet. Therefore, it was in the self-interest of everyone to join this, this regime of the, of the International Atomic Energy um, Agency. And it would argue in an, a natural, uh, in an analogy um, for, for, for the DSA, um, basically saying, well, it is in the self-interest of every state to, to cooperate in order to make sure that, that no one can be able to destroy the planet for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is verification as feasible in the domain of database systems as it is in the domain of nuclear technologies? Um, absolutely. There, I would argue that thanks to the fact that in order to be digital or in order to be data-based, um, there is data. So in a sense, uh, you know, if you think about, for example, the possibility we have with blockchain technology that you can, I'm not you know, going into the field of cryptocurrencies right now, it's not very... <laughs> trendy at the moment, of course, but if you look at the technology and its fundament allowing us to document in real time every step which is happening, that would allow us, and you know, just as a one possible technological solution, to, to get a global understanding of what's, what's happening um, in this area, even better than in nuclear technology, um, because we would, have to, we would have the direct real-time databases for it. So every computer in the world would be monitored? It sounds unrealistic, but thanks to the possibilities we have to scale up the computing capabilities, um, think about you know, the possible future of quantum computing, for example, um, yeah, it would go down that, that line. Yeah. I'd like to just add Daniele to, to this. Daniele wrote a note here that, that comes in earlier, like what, what, what you were um, setting up originally, and he says, it seems to me that the difference in regulation between pharma and communication or media um, is that in the first scenario, pharma, we're under the impression that we're dealing, um, can't do this, hold on, that we're dealing, why can't I see this? Sorry. We're under the impression that we're dealing with chemicals or molecules that necessarily will impact bodies in a deterministic way. Well, in the second scenario, communications or media, um, we are under the impression um, that we're dealing with free, autonomous, self-contained wills that are entitled to what some people call free speech, for instance. And whether these impressions are accurate is in question, but I was thinking of that when you were talking before, when Thomas went from from individuals to states. Um, there, there's something here in the way we're talking about human. You were talking about human rights that is um, that is deterministic or indeterministic, and there's a big difference there. No, I fully agree with you, and, and thanks so much, Daniele, for this um, for this comment. Um, I think you know if we if we take this this human rights based approach to database systems, um, 
we have, I think we have to take into consideration that, that the human rights to, to free speech comes together, for example, right from the beginning with the human right to non-discrimination, for example. So we know right from the beginning that there will be limiting factors to these human rights. So the other human rights are also limiting, you know, the other, the other human rights. So I would argue that it's not really a conflict coming up between two rights, but it's rather in, inherent to these rights that they are a part of a catalog which needs to, based on the principle of indivisibility, needs to be respected as an entire catalog. Um, so that helps us to then, you know, find in, in, a, in the process of implementing, um, you know, the, the right approach to dealing with, with the questions you were, uh, or the, the, the points you were raising in your, in your comment. Um, and in addition, um, it may, it might seem to be just, you know, part of communication and information um, technologies. But at the end of the day, if you look at the very concrete, um, real impact they have in, 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 in so-called real life. Um, so take again, for example, the Facebook example, you know, hate speech, call for anger, call for violence, then Lead, led to concrete violence on the street against concrete humans, you, you realize very quickly, and there are a lot of other examples for that, that we cannot say, well, it's just information, just, just information or just communication, but it is, it has a very concrete and very physical impact on, on so-called real, um, real life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll just add one last comment that um, I come from philosophy. I mean, human rights I do on the ground, but when I look at it from the philosophical angle and you look at deep, deep um, critique of human rights, the whole idea, there's the liberalism involved, there's the individuality, individualism that is involved um, uh, when Thomas went on to states rather than than, than individuals. I, I'm not sure that human rights, well, I am sure, but I, I think there's a problem with making human rights our God. Um, the, the, there are problems with the very idea of human rights, or at least the classical way that we've always looked at human rights, including the fact that it's the UN that's on top of it all. Probably this would be the point where we disagree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I would, because I would, I would really strongly argue for if you look. I mean, if you look for, um, you know, somehow some global basis we could work on. Um, I'm not sure if we have an alternative yeah. um, to to human rights, um, which is close to that kind of global acceptance human rights are enjoying, with all the problems which are there from a ph ph philosophical point. If you have food, fully agree with you, but I think um, most of them are resolvable and are addressable. Take, for example. The the, the, the issue you were raising regarding individualism. Um, I would say, of course, there are individual rights, but they are um, taking care also or um, taking into consideration the relation between individuals and communities because they're not Peter Kirschlager rights. So not just me enjoying them and everybody else needs to respect my rights, but as human rights, they lead to corresponding duties and responsibilities for everyone. And, and, and also Article 29 of the Universal Declaration of 1948 um, points out explicitly um, that individuals need to be understood as part of communities and they have to take care about the communities as the communities have to be taken care of them. So um, I think it's, it's not adequate. To, I would argue it's not adequate to say that, that human rights are individualistic. They are individual rights, but they understand individuals as part of the most inclusive possible imaginable um, community, namely all humans, not just, you know, US Americans, not just Swiss, but not just Europeans, but all humans um, um, together. Thank you. Thanks.